This is uh, an evening sponsored by Descent Magazine uh, to uh, talk about some of the things that we're talking about in our uh, summer issue. And um, the topic tonight is the quiet, uh, quiet revolution about uh, Barack Obama. And most of you probably are familiar with, uh, with Descent, but if you didn't hear about this through an email from us, we do have a sign-up sheet, which is... By the food. Okay, maybe somebody can pass that around. Um, and if, if you want to get emails about these events, which happen at least every quarter, um, and also highlight uh, things that are going on on our e-newsletter, uh, give us your email. And um, I want to welcome all of you who are subscribers, board members, editors, writers, and, um, and readers. Um, we're going to just start, because I know, I think everybody has an opinion on this topic, and uh, we'll be eager to express it and to hear what our panelists have to say. Um, our first uh, first speaker is Eugene Gibhart, who has a piece in the current issue called Defending Obama, and uh, he is the Aditha Macy Professor of Humanities Emeritus at Brandeis University, the author of books of literary and cultural, um, as well as um, of literary and cultural books, as well as a memoir. Confessions of a Secular Jew. Uh, his most recent book is Darwinian Misadventures in the Humanities. And he says that, like everyone else, he has become preoccupied with the current political situation. So we'll find out how preoccupied. Okay. <clears throat> I've been given uh, eight to ten minutes, so I've made sure to write it down. Um, now, <clears throat> before I summarize what I wrote about Obama in the current issue of Dissent, I'd like to say something about how I came to write the piece. At some point months ago, liberal friends of mine began to bombard me with emails and phone calls, berating him for failing to keep his campaign promises and his fecklessness in promoting a liberal, liberal agenda. He was disappointing the expectation he aroused that he would be a transformative president. Compromise seems to be the motive, mode in which he operates most comfortably. His economic team has ties to Wall Street. His stimulus package was inadequate. He had decided not to prosecute the Bush legal team for sanctioning torture of suspended terrorists and so on. And I was struck by a disposition to give him little, if any, credit for his achievements on the economy, the environment, education, and support for the sciences, which were already considerable. Now, it's been the habit of critics in the media to invoke liberal heroes of the past, Lincoln, FDR, and even LBJ, as models for what a bold presidency could achieve in times of crisis, and find Obama terribly wanting in comparison. So I decided to read up on his predecessors for historical perspective. And the more I read, the more I was struck by the unfairness of the contrast. Lincoln, of the popular imagination, is a heroic figure who freed the slaves and preserved the Union in one fell swoop. Now, Lincoln's one non-negotiable principle was the preservation of the Union. With respect to slavery and other political issues, he was by temperament and in practice a principled comprom compromiser of the first order. The emancipation of the slaves was achieved incrementally and slowly to the distress of the abolitionists of his own party. And even the Emancipation Proclamation, issued late in the war, was a compromise that applied only to the slaves in the Confederacy. When he was challenged for the Republican nomination for a second term by the abolitionist Secretary of Treasury, Salmon Chase, he rebuked Chase's supporter, Charles Sumner, who will split this two-headed party of unionists and abolitionists that I have done my best for years to hold together. The moderates, of which I am one, will desert you, while the peace at any price, folks, will vote you down, and McClellan, who was the Democratic candidate, in. And isn't Obama following the same model in trying to hold together the two heads of his party, the liberals and the blue dogs? The prevailing view is that FDR was the bold partisan of liberal programs, while Obama is a futile seeker of bipartisan compromise. The historian William Luchtenberg tells a somewhat different story. With a significantly greater congressional majority in 1937, 
that Obama has now, Roosevelt was riding, I'm quoting, was riding a tiger for the new Congress threatened to push him in a direction far more radical than any he had originally contemplated. Of course, the current Congress is pushing Obama in the opposite direction. Like o Obama's stimulus package, Roosevelt also fell short of what was needed. He was always willing to compromise, for instance, in his support of anti-lynching legislation, which he resisted making must legislation, for if he did, the Southern Committee Chairman in Congress might kill every economic proposal he asked them to advance. Max Lerner was speaking for the left when he characterized FDR as a blunderer and temporizer. The two main domestic achievements were the National Labor Relations Act, which strengthened the unions and Social Security. As for the former, Ro Roosevelt declared himself neutral because, again, he didn't want to offend the Southern leaders in Congress. It was the achievement of Senator Robert Wagner of New York. Roosevelt signed it into law, and it became one of the great achievements of his administration. The Social Security Act, in its original form, <coughs> excluded a large portion of the working class. Roosevelt wanted something more comprehensive, but it had to go along with the Congress. Fortunately, it evolved, as I believe will, the new Health Reform Act. The New Deal humanized our industrial system, but it was a long struggle with its share of compromises and misdirection. And finally, LBJ on Medicare. Legend has it that the enactment of Medicare was the masterful work of Johnson and a model of how a president should act in compelling Congress to enact legislation. In 1964, a year into his presidency, Johnson, with all the skill he had honed as Senate Majority Leader, tried to have Medicare enacted, but to no avail. The effort has been described as a debacle. One commentator reviewing the LBJ White House tapes faults the Johnson administration for greedy overreaching. When the bill finally passed a year later after Johnson's landslide victory over Goldwater, it was Wilbur Mills, the powerful chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, who after opposing the bill in 1964, now made it possible. Johnson learned for the first time what the bill contained from Mills. He was not the author of the bill. Now this takes nothing away from the passion, persistence, and ultimate effectiveness with which LBJ fought for Medicare. But it puts in perspective Obama's achievement in health care reform, the difficulty, the messiness, and the ultimate success. From the distance of time, great achievements occlude the messy process that brought them into existence. And I believe that in the future, health care reform will have the glow of Social Security and Medicare. Now, did Obama betray the promise to be a transformative president that he made in the campaign? I don't think he misspoke in his campaign. He said again and again that he wanted to overcome the destructive polarization in our political life. If he succeeds, that would be transformation indeed. He has certainly not succeeded up to this point. And it's doubtful that faced with Republican intransigence, he will have much success in the future. So why doesn't he simply give up on bipartisanship and may become a passionate partisan advocate for what he truly believes? For the simple reason that given the alignment of political forces, he would get absolutely nothing done. He would not have gotten the stimulus package or the financial reform bill through Congress without making concessions and peeling off Republican votes. We would not have the health care bill without bipartisanship, so to speak, within the Democratic Party itself, which meant giving up on the public option to satisfy the blue dogs. Any president in a non-parliamentary two-party system which requires a supermajority in the Senate to pass legislation needs to be both partisan and bipartisan. He also needs to know when to give full voice to partisanship and when to mute it. In less than two years, and in the most difficult of times, Obama has shown himself to be a progressive liberal leader, at once thoughtful and decisive with major domestic accomplishments. And here is a selective list. A stimulus package